Well, earlier, Richard Hazelton read the classic Christmas story from Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. And it ended by talking about the angel's announcement. You've heard it hundreds of times if you've been around church. It talked about peace on earth. But isn't that just escapism? Isn't that what we Christians really do at Christmas when we talk about peace on earth? I mean, after all, the earth is filled with horrendous things. There are mean-spirited people. There is violence all around. So what are we just practicing wishful thinking when we talk about peace on earth? Here's what the angel said, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Isn't that a mere sentimental hope? Wishful thinking at best. Well, the world into which Jesus was born was a very violent place to be sure. Rome ruled their empire with an iron fist. If you kept your head down and did what you were told, you could make it if you could deal with their taxes. But if you dared to challenge, you might be crushed under the heel of Roman supremacy. It was a violent world. But you know, we live in a very violent world today, don't we? I read a couple of provocative articles this week about violence and war in our world. One entitled, What Every Person Should Know About War said that out of the last 3,400 years of history, human beings have been at peace only 268 of those years. In another article by Mark Malloy entitled The Planet's History of Violence, Mark says there are 12,703 battles where we have an exact location and date. And the estimate for deaths due to war is well over three billion people throughout history. In fact, in the 20th century alone, one, it's estimated that 108 million people just in the 20th century have died directly due to war. But here's the fact that blows my mind. I discovered this week that currently, as we sit here, over 40 wars are raging around the world. Did you know that? You don't hear about most of them. They might be border skirmishes between nations. It might be tribal warfare, civil war within a country. It might be guerrilla warfare that kind of goes under the radar. Not a lot of people hear about it outside of the area. But as we sit here today, as we speak, there are over 40 wars being waged around the world. Now, if if everybody seems to be talking about peace around Christmas time, how can you justify that? Why is there so much violence? I mean, does nobody really care? I think a lot of people care. In fact, I would say peace is one of the deepest heart yearnings of many people that I know. Back in seminary, I took a class in ethics taught by Dr. Glenn Stassen. He was kind of known as an expert on peace and peacemaking. He'd written dozens of published articles, a number of books on the subject. And we spent weeks, as I recall, in class discussing different views on what various groups believe will bring world peace. Let me just mention a couple, two or three. Leon Trotsky, for instance, who was the early Russian Marxist and the first leader of the Red Army, said, a world communist revolution will lead to world peace. If we could just get the world, he said, to embrace communism, and have a revolution, we'll have peace all over the world. But a 70-year experiment with that ended in a dismal failure. It imploded on itself in the 1980s and left behind an ugly legacy of literally millions of people executed because they dared to stand against the state government. Others believe that democracy is the key. If we could just get 
governments to be led in a democratic fashion around the world, we'd have world peace. Former President George W. Bush, for instance, said at the start of the Iraq War, the march of democracy will lead to world peace. And it's often pointed out by proponents of this view that no two democracies have ever gone to war against one another. Now, I love this democratic republic in which we live. I love our form of government. I think it's probably the best on the planet, but I in no way believe that democracy is somehow the magical key to peace. Humans will always find a way to mess that up. Others believe that increasing globalization is the way to have the peace we seek. We just need more treaties. We need more peace conferences. We need more alliances. We need to sit down and collaborate and have discussions. And they'll point to things like the European Union as an example, where countries chose to ally themselves and follow certain guidelines and get along. And yet today, as we sit here, the European Union is in horrible disarray. Again, humans always find some way to mess it up. And then there are those who take a more radical stand. We say, say we should just be pacifists. If we would just destroy all the weapons in the world, there would be no weapons with which to fight and there would be peace. Most leaders believe that's a bit naive. Some push back strongly and say, no, just the opposite is true. The key to peace is strength. We need not disarmament, we need more arms. We need to have weapons that will be so awesome that just the mere possibility of them being used and the destruction they would bring will actually avert war rather than bring it. And we could spend hours today talking about all the possibilities and nuances of them that many groups believe will bring world peace. But I'm a, I'm a Christian today. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And I want to insert this question into this conversation about peace. What does the birth of the life, the teaching, the miracles, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ have to do with this. I mean, we're going to celebrate his birth in just a few days. What does his birth add to this discussion? Jesus made a provocative statement as recorded in John's Gospel, chapter 14. He said, peace I live, leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Now, whatever you make of that statement, one thing I'm really encouraged by is that that says to me that Jesus wants us to experience peace. He doesn't want us to live lives driven by fear and consternation and worry. He doesn't want us to go around fretting. He wants us to be marked by peace peace, a pervasive peace that lasts. And yet there's a problem. Why do we not experience that? James, one of the writers in the Bible, chapter 4, verse 1, asks this question, what causes fights and quarrels among you? And then he answers his own question. He says, isn't it your desires that battle within you? It's almost as though James is saying the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. Jesus weighs in on that matter. And he talks about where all these evil things in the world, all these things that we, we're so amazed at all the violence and all the corruption and all the evil in the world. He weighs in on that. Mark's Gospel, chapter 7. Here's what Jesus said. Now remember, these are the words of Jesus. I highlight that because while all Scripture is inspired by God, I sometimes believe that when we're dealing with the very words of Jesus, we kind of need to note that. It's not like there's a hierarchy of Scripture. It's all true. It's all inspired. But Jesus' words should really get our attention. Jesus said, For from within... Out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, 
fornications, thefts, murders, adultery, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. Again, it's as though Jesus is giving his commentary. What's wrong with the world? It's the heart of humanity. What's wrong with the world? I am. I'm what's wrong with the world. You're what's wrong with the world. And once we understand the heart of the human problem, we can begin to search for a solution. Jesus made another amazing statement in that very same conversation, by the way. This was all in the upper room discourse just before he was arrested and crucified. Here's what he said, John 16. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. Well, history testifies to the truth of that, doesn't it? I mean, just go online. Just read your favorite news source. Pick up your local newspaper. You will see that the world is plagued by trouble. In this world, Jesus said, you're going to have trouble, but I have come to bring peace. So I want to go back to my question. How does the birth, the life, the teaching, the miracles, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus how does it add to this discussion about peace? Just for a few moments this morning, I want to talk with you about that. I want to mention two different kinds of peace that Scripture talks about, and both of them are vital. I want both of these for you. If you catch a little extra passion in my voice today, please understand, because the things we're talking about are among the most important issues we could ever discuss. In fact, I would say they are paramount. I want to talk with you about the two different kinds of peace that Jesus came to bring. The first one is peace with God. Have you ever heard that phrase? Maybe you've watched it on a movie and someone was on their deathbed or they were really struggling to live and someone would come along and go, have you made your peace with God? You know? And we urge people when we believe they're in trouble, oh, you better make your peace. Now, what does that imply? That implies that normally we don't have peace with God. The writers of the Bible Paul, in particular, put it this way. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. There's your phrase. Through, how does it come? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to I give you cliff notes in the Bible. If you're window shopping Christianity today, maybe, maybe you're wondering what this is all about. Please listen closely right now. The Bible says God created humanity and he wants a relationship with us. That's how he designed us, to be in relationship with God. But there's a problem. Something came in and separated us from God. And it has caused all kinds of chaos. Not only are we alienated from God, we're alienated from our own self to a degree. And we're certainly alienated from one another. And so we walk around in this fog of darkness wondering, who am I? What's the meaning to life? Why am I here? What is my purpose? Where is all of this going? And again, the Bible's answer to that is crystal clear. God loves you and created you for a relationship with him. So whoever you are, I want this to ring in your ears today. You are not a cosmic accident. You are not a mass of random particles and cells that got together and created something called consciousness, but you don't know why you're here. That's not the deal. God created you for a purpose, and your life can be infused with meaning whenever you get reconnected to your creator. But again, that's where the problem comes in. From the very first humans, right down to you and me, every one of us has sinned and fallen short of God's standards. We violated his values, his principles, his laws, his commands. 
and my sin has separated me from God. The good news is that God wants to reconcile. I know that's a big word, but don't let it confuse you. God wants to reconcile that relationship. He wants us to be friends in the profoundest sense of the word. By the way, if you're here today because this is what you like to do around Christmas time, I think you've made a good choice to be here. Uh, I'm glad you're here. If you come to church maybe around Christmas and Easter, hey, I think that's a better choice than watching football commentary all day. Amen? I really do. I'm so glad that you've made this choice. If you're here today because you just like to show up at Christmas, whether you need it or not, you're here. I'm so glad you're here. It is an awesome choice. I think it's a better choice than choosing to shop till you drop, if you know what I mean. So glad you're here. But here's what I would urge you to do. Please don't just give a cordial nod to Jesus at Christmas and then forget about it. Why do I urge you not to do that? Because you need to understand, if you never have before, Christmas led to something. Christmas led to a cross. It didn't all stop with the cute little manger and the baby in the manger. Christmas led to a cross. And we can't leave that out of the story or Christmas makes no ultimate sense at all. Christmas means God came on a rescue mission to save people like you and me from our sins. And let me tell you today, he didn't come just to give us some sage wisdom for the ages. Oh, we need wisdom, don't we? I'll take all I can get. But that's not the main reason Jesus came, just to give us some good teaching, although I recommend his teachings. Jesus didn't come just to motivate us. To say, hey, get up, put a smile on your face every day and tackle your problems. Well, that can be helpful. It's nice to have a motivator every now and then, but that's not the main reason Jesus came. Jesus didn't come to help us just financially, although if you follow his principles, I assure you, it can lead to some wonderful financial conclusions. Jesus came, please hear this, because I needed saving. And you needed saving. In fact, the Bible uses a word called justified. It's a legal word. And let me explain it to you. In the verse we read earlier, here's how the Apostle Paul put it. And I want to explain to you what this means. It's really important. He said, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Peace with God. It's a legal term. It means that I no longer am in debt to God. I no longer owe anything because of my sin. I've been justified. The slate has been wiped clean. I've been forgiven and set free from that debt I owe. Let me, let me illustrate it like this. I've heard this story for years all over the place. I hope it's a true story, but if it's not, it's still a good story. I think it makes the point. There was a man in England who was driving his Rolls Royce, and he wanted to take his holiday on the mainland in Europe, and so he took his car over across the channel by boat, and he started enjoying his holiday in Europe. And he drove for a few days, but his Rolls Royce developed an engine problem. So he actually contacted the headquarters back in Derby, England, and told them about the problem. They said, we'll be right on it. And very quickly, they flew a mechanic over to fix the engine. And the mechanic fixed it. He spent the night and flew back the next day. And the man was so happy because now he could get on with his holiday. And he went on for a number of days, having a great time. But he kept wondering in his mind, wow, what is this going to cost me? I mean, to fly a mechanic over here, to put him up for the night, to pay all those expenses, and then to fly him back. I mean, this is going to cost me a fortune. And so when he got back home, he decided to write a rather formal letter about it because he'd received no bill in the mail. There was no charge. And so he wrote them and asked how much he owed. And he received back this reply. Dear sir, there is no record anywhere in our files 
that anything ever went wrong with a Rolls Royce. And that's exactly what justified means. There's no record anywhere in your files in heaven that anything ever went wrong with you. That's how it is when you're justified. Then you say, but pastor, that's not true. Because I can tell you right now, there's a lot of stuff wrong with me. There should be a lot on that record. You're right. But to be justified, to have peace with God, means that God took all of the breakdowns that I had in my life morally, all of the times I had sinned and failed him and gone off the rails, away from his standards and values, he took all of that junk off of my record and put it on the record of Christ, and Jesus bore all of that and paid for it at the cross. That's what the cross is all about, folks. Jesus dying there to pay the charges that I owed, the debts that I owed, because of my breakdowns and sins and failures. Jesus took it for me. And when I, by faith, accept that as the all-sufficient payment for my sins and put my trust in Christ alone and what he did for me, the scripture calls that being justified being saved. There are numerous words it uses. And I'm then not only forgiven, I'm adopted into God's family, and he literally begins to change me from the inside out. Now, let me ask you today, has that ever happened to you? Do you have peace with God, and are you confident that you have peace with God? If you cannot confidently say, Pastor, I know that I have peace with God through my Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to pray in just a few minutes, and I'm going to urge you at that time to pray to God. I'll guide you, and we'll spend just a few moments as you do business with God, because there's nothing more important than peace with God. But now I want to turn a corner. It's been just a few minutes. We're going to be very brief, but I want to talk about that second kind of peace. We talked about two kinds of peace. One is peace with God, but then there's another kind of peace the Bible talks about frequently, and that is the peace of God. It's different. It really is. It's different. The peace of God. Would you say today, just being honest, don't raise your hand, But just answer this in your heart. Would you say that you experience the peace of God day by day? For many people I know, Christmas is the most stressful season of the year. I mean, all kinds of things are happening. It is frenetic. Would you agree? I mean, you just go to the mall. You can just lose your peace immediately just by trying to get a parking place. You know how it is. Some of you are going to lose your peace when you try to leave here today. Some fellow worshiper is going to cut you off out there in the parking lot. and You're going to be tempted to give those ancient cryptic hand signals to your fellow <laughs> worshipers. You're going to lose that peace. Listen to what Scripture says. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Do you think that's happening with you? Do you think that's happening with you? To what degree do you have peace in your life today? You say, Pastor, I'm a little offended by what you're saying. How can you speak? How can you dare speak so blithely about the peace of God when there's horrible things happening? Aren't you aware of them, Pastor? Oh, oh yeah. I mean, I know families in our church that medically speaking, There's no cure for what they're facing. And unless God intervenes miraculously, the prognosis is not positive. I know families who relationally are so torn apart, there's such strife in the family, and Christmas just exacerbates that, you'll have to agree. I mean, it just accentuates what is already there. And I know family members who won't even talk to one another. It makes Christmas get-togethers really fun, let me tell you. Ooh. I know people in this church 
who are under such stress financially, they're wondering what the future holds. They're wondering how they're ever going to get out of the mess they're in. I know, I know about that. I know people who have had such heartache this year relationally. They have people let them down, betray them, stab them in the back. It's horrendous. And it's robbed them of peace and created enormous stress. And I know families in this church, this is going to be the first Christmas without their loved one because they passed away this year. And that house feels awfully lonely. For the first time at Christmas, there's going to be an empty chair at the table. There's all kinds of things that would rob us this Christmas of the peace of God. There's an awful lot of pain. But I want to tell you something that always is helpful to me. It's not on the screens, but I want to share with you what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. He said there, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I'm meek and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Can I tell you what I do? When I'm having a particularly stressful week, I go to that verse. I go to Jesus' words and I say, Lord, I, it sure isn't feeling like the yoke is easy right now. Jesus, you said the burden was light, and boy, it doesn't feel light. It feels kind of heavy. In fact, Lord, I'm kind of feeling crushed right now under the burden and the weight of all this stuff. Would you help me? I just say this in prayer. Lord, would you lift the burden? Would you show me how to rightly yoke up with you? It's interesting. A yoke was this piece of wood, usually with some leather on it, that was put on the shoulders of two oxen, typically, and usually the oxen weren't of the same strength. One could be very strong and one could be weak. But you know what you could do? You could adjust the yoke so that the strong ox would carry most of the burden. I think that may be what Jesus had in mind. Yoke up with me. I'll give you the strength. I'll pull the weight. I'll do the heavy lifting, Jesus said. I'll take that stress. I'll take that burden for you. Let me pull this and carry this. And I believe that's what some of us need this Christmas. The Apostle Paul put it like this. He said, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, Present your request to God. And then he gives this promise, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So I want to go full circle. Is all this talk about peace just wishful thinking? Are we Christians just escapists who stick our heads in the sand and avoid the real problems of the world? Or is there any reality to this? Oh, oh my goodness. I have learned, and there are many around you today who have learned by experience that you can truly yoke up with Jesus and you can find a peace that transcends all understanding. You can't even explain it, really. It has a touch of the miraculous to it. As a boy growing up, I remember many times watching a mother bird in a nest. We had all these wild creatures around us living out on the farm, with woods all around. And I remember watching a mother bird sitting in a nest, and I have seen a mother bird sitting on eggs go through the most horrendous lightning and rainstorms you can imagine with sheets of rain pounding down and washing over them. And I've seen that mother bird in the midst of the storm sit there with perfect calm, sometimes even eyes closed, in spite of the intensity all around. It seemed as though she had perfect peace. That's a picture for me of what can be true in our lives. I don't know all of the storms that are going on around you today, but I believe this. When you know, listen, listen, when you know you've got peace with God and your sins are forgiven, hey, if you don't, you talk about stress. Whew. 
I don't know anything more stressful than that, to not know with confidence that my sins are forgiven and that I have peace with God. Boy, that is a stressor right there. But when you know that is true, and then you let the peace of God guard over your heart and mind, listen, you can have a peace that passes all understanding, and I want that for you this season. I'm going to invite you right now to do something. I want you to pray with me, please. Would you bow your heads all across the sanctuary? We're going to have a brief time of prayer. And then our worship team will return and lead us as we close our service today. We'll continue worshiping just a bit longer. But I want to ask you today to do something for me, just to help me a little bit know if this is relevant to you. It, if you're here today, and before I pray, you'd just like to indicate by raising your hand, Pastor, would you just kind of include me in that prayer? Just, I want you to know I'm out here. I want you to know I'd love to be included in this prayer about peace with God, because I want to leave here today confident that I am in the family of God, that my sins are forgiven. Would you just slip your hand up real quick and then put it right back down? Thank you. Wow. Thank you for all these hands over here on this side, back there in the back. I see your hand back there. Thank you over here. Wow. Thank you over here on the far side. Wow, thank you. Anybody else before we pray? Anybody else before we pray? Thank you. Yes. Father, I pray for all of these, and I love the honesty. Men and women and young people just saying, I don't have that confidence, Pastor. I want to have that sense of assurance that I have peace with God. Father, would you meet them right where they are today? Would you wash over their soul with a sense of confidence that you love them and that your grace is sufficient for all of these things and that you're ready to forgive? Now, if you would like to pray this prayer with me, friends, I want to ask you to pray it right where you are, just phrase by phrase. Oh, God, thank you for loving me. Please forgive me of all my sin. Adopt me into your family and begin to change me from the inside out. I give my life to you. I want to know that I have peace with God. And Father, I pray for all of those that you have regenerated that you have justified, that you have converted and saved, I ask that you would save and seal them now. Keep them safe in your grace and sustain them, Lord, as you guide them providentially from this moment on. Father, I ask that they would begin to see increasing signs that they not only have peace with you, but they have the peace of God ruling in their hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.